Judge Penny Brown Reynolds, an advocate for social justice, stole our hearts as the star of the family court, uh, as the star of family court with Judge Penny. She was also selected by CNN as one of America's leading intellectuals. She obtained a law degree from Georgia State University School of Law, her master's degree from the Interdenominational Theological Center, and the list goes on. She's also the founder and executive of multiple organizations. She is a noted author, and if I were to tell you everything this woman has done, her accomplishments, and her impact to the planet, we will be here for seven days, yeah. <laughs> right? But let me tell you a personal note about Judge Penny Brown Reynolds. She's also my personal mentor, Amen. and she's a mentor to many. She's someone who I can call and say, Judge, I'm dealing with this issue because sometimes in leadership, you can't tell everybody what you're dealing with. Right. You've got to tell folks that can understand and give you good advice. Not only would she give me sound advice, take time out of a very busy uh, schedule, she's a law professor, uh, getting a, a doctorate degree now, she just does a lot, but she takes time, she takes time to give me sound advice. And on top of that advice, when she finishes, sometimes she's getting on me because I should have known better, right? She ends it with a prayer. She ends it with a prayer. That's tough to find in leadership these days. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, our guest for tonight, the Honorable Judge Penny Brown Reynolds. justice life, even your uh, political life, because you have that as well. Uh, tell us about your upbringing. Hmm. Tell us about Mama Del. All right. First of all, good evening to everybody. Good evening. It's an honor to be here with you. I'm so proud of you and all that you're accomplishing. Thank you. You represent young males and black males very well, and just men in general well. Can we give him a round of applause? I was... Um, Born to a single woman who raised me, and I am a village child who was raised by my grandparents in a Catholic background in a place called Laplace, Louisiana. Explain village child, because I got some young students over here. They may not quite understand what that means. Village child is a child who is reared in the same house with your grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so your mother will raise you, and then your aunts or your aunties uncles, and everybody has a hand in rearing you. And so that's what I mean by saying I'm a village child. What was it in your upbringing that caused you to say, I want to make a dynamic impact in the world, and I want to choose ministry and the law to do so? I was born in an era, 1961, mm. um, where we were the beneficiaries of the civil rights movement. So I wasn't old enough to be a part of it, but I could watch it. And I saw a number of um, disparities and inequalities that I witnessed even as a child. And it had an incredible impact on me, as did the media, because I would watch the Ed Sullivan show and watch all the entertainers at Morehouse, uh, at uh, Motown. And so there was something in me. I wasn't trained to be a leader. I was born to be. And so it wasn't anything that I had to do. I had a strong connection with God from the very beginning, albeit through the Catholic faith. And my grandmother was a woman of faith. She was also a mystic, believing in the spiritual side of who you are as opposed to necessarily the religious side. Educated woman. Um, and, and taught me how to be a lady. That was a big issue. But I think for me, um, just watching things and knowing that I really wanted more. Growing up in poverty, didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth, and knowing that I wanted more. And so I would dream, um, big dreams. We lived across the street from railroad tracks. And back then, the car 
signs for the railroad tracks would stop near my home. And we called them hobos at the time. And these were gentlemen that were from New York and all over the country. And they would come off the, uh, off the car, and my grandmother would make sandwiches, and I would be on the front porch, and I would entertain them, or I would have conversations with them. And they'd fallen on hard times. We call them homeless now, but we used to call them hobos back right. then. And I wasn't taught to fear them or anything, but I remember <laughs> seeing and hearing about the world through their eyes. I remember the first time I saw you, uh, you were this fiery judge on television. But you looked so sweet. <laughs> well, thank you. Right. <laughs> remember that, right? And I said, this woman is amazing. And you had this authenticity about you. And I became, I was a young brother, and I became a fan of your show on top of everybody else's. And here's why. And I've never told you this before. I remember the time you cried. I remember the time you cried while on your TV show. And I, out of all of the judges, and we've seen them all because she was up there with uh, Judge Mathis and everybody else, I had never seen that kind of humanity because everybody was really, really fixated on doing a show, mm -hmm. right? And Jeff, if we could, let's, let's play some of the um, intro that we used to see almost every day. Judge first, and then we'll get into TV. I went to law school for the purpose of becoming a judge. When you are so marginalized uh, growing up and disenfranchised, I decided that I would have a career that would matter, that I would be respected for, that you couldn't even call me by my name, that you'd have to say judge first, because I watched the degradation of my mother and my grandmother on so many levels. My grandmother was, was a, a wife of a person who domestic violence was just a part of how we grew up. And I just made up my mind, let me pick a job. And I really had big dreams of becoming a judge. It was hard, um, Dr. Rashad, because I didn't have any money. And I was homeless for a time. 
I was a mother, I had a divorce, and went into the cycle of being married to people who did the same thing that I watched in my house. I mean, you say you're not going to do it, but somehow you're attracted to that same kind of man. And so I just left the town and just decided to come here to Georgia because everything that I had read about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., if I could just get to Atlanta, I knew if I could just make it to Atlanta, everything was going to be all right. Well, you make it to Atlanta, and only you realize Atlanta's a big place, <laughs> and you don't know a whole lot of people. And so I lived in a hotel for a while, but I knew that I had to have my education. And so I went. The funniest story happened when I went to Georgia State. I didn't go to the undergraduate, because I came here with any degrees. I actually went to the law school. And I said to the young lady who was at the front desk, the receptionist, oh, I wanna, I'm coming because I'm going to enroll in law school. And she said, OK, where did you go to undergrad? I said, what do you mean, where did I go to undergrad? And she says, you haven't gone to undergraduate? You have to go to, you have to have an undergraduate degree first. And I said, well, where do you go to get that? And she said, well, she kind of chuckled. And she did it in a way that was belittling. I'll never forget that. And so I said, where do I go? I went to Georgia State. I finished in two years and three quarters at the top of my class. Mm -hmm. Went back, graduated, and she was still at that desk <laughs> doing what she was doing. Because I have never allowed ridicule or anybody putting me down. Because one of my superpowers is being underestimated. And I knew that a long time ago. So when you put me down, you only fuel me. When you talk about me, you only fuel me. It, it just, I'm one of these people that I was going to show them that I was going to show her better than I could tell her. And so I went to school around the clock, worked, did whatever I had to do. But I knew I wanted to be a judge. So when I got to law school, I had to apply for law school, got into law school. Georgia State was difficult. 220 of us, about 12, were African Americans. Keisha Lance Bottoms, who's now the mayor, she and I were classmates. A few others finished law school. And I would look at the cases. When you are in law school, it's done by what's called the Socratic method, which means it's a method where they teach you how to think logically, and it's done through case law. So you can't memorize your way through law school. You have to interpret the cases and put them into relation to what the law is and argue both sides. But every time I would do it, I would always pretend I was the judge <laughs> and how I would rule. So I would sit there and write out my lessons as though I was the judge because I'm a firm believer in the stream of consciousness. And if I want to be that thing, I've got to start walking and acting like that person. And I've got to believe it and see it and feel it. And so while I was walking around broke, sleeping in a car, homeless, no matter what anybody else said, I knew that what was put inside of me was going to come to pass. I was on the bench in my 30s, one of the youngest judges to ever, individuals to ever get on the bench, and I did it in six years. You can't even do that now. You have to be 10 years. But I was very, very strategic because I'm a strategic person. I thought about, well, who puts judges on the bench? The government. So what I had to do was make certain that I actually worked my way to a situation so that I could get to be in front of a governor. So I came out of law school. I clerked at a law firm, Nelson Mullins, Riley, and Scarborough. And I also clerked at the Attorney General's office, which was Mike Bowers at the time. Yep. And so I took the bar exam. You can't even do that now. In my third year of law school, studied for it because I knew that I needed to graduate knowing that I had taken that bar and passed it. And that's what I did. And I took the job at the Attorney General's office because of government service. Wow. From there, I ended up going to work for Lieutenant Governor Pierre Howard. So I worked in every branch of government. I was a law clerk for the Court of Appeal, Jack Ruffin, who's now deceased. So I've been a law clerk. And you know, that's very prestigious to be a law clerk for a Court of Appeals judge. So I did that. So I built my resume um, without being ashamed of where I had come from. Because I thought that I didn't want to carry the shame. Because a lot of it, I didn't cause. Yeah. 
because I knew that I wanted to be an inspiration to other people. And the only way to do that is not to hide from what you were. And just tell people, everybody makes mistakes. There was only one perfect one, as I know, and that was Jesus. Right? And so I did that, but I was very, very strategic. Pierre Howard, I was watching television Christmas Eve, and he said he was running for governor. And I said, I need to work for him. I sat there, I did a letter, sent the le had the, hand, the, letter, the letter hand delivered on Christmas Eve, and he interviewed me right there, and then I got the job. Mm. He decided he was not going to run for governor, and that then his opponent, Roy Barnes, mm. hired the attorney for his opponent. Mm. I knew God was in it then. Mm. I was very clear about wanting to be a judge. Two years later, I was put on the bench. And that's how I got in the pants, being very, very strategic, being very prayerful, and really and honestly, Dr. Rashad, believing God. God. Too many people don't believe God. Right. Mm -hmm. And I hold God to God's word. Amen. Because if we are prepared, if we, we put our mind on something and we really prepare, and God speaks to us and says, it's yours, I will make the provisions, all you have to do is do it, it shall be so. People laughed at me, can you believe that? With all that I had to give, they laughed at me. They didn't think. The moment I told them I was going to school, they said, mm -hmm, okay, that's good. But now look, oh, I knew it all along. That's right, right. And, and we all After have that. Right? Yeah, they jump on the bandwagon. Once oh, that's absolutely. Right. What I hear is as educated as you were, charismatic, brilliant, driven, all of that leadership, all of that transformational leadership power still had to be strategic yes. for you to get to where you wanted to go. It did not happen by way of osmosis. In addition to that, what I also hear is that your strategy was also informed by your faith. Yes. That you remained faithful to your value system, to your belief in God, to your belief in Christ. How has let, let, me, let me clarify that so you can really understand. When I was 12 years old, I was hanging clothes on a clothesline. Okay. I lived in a shotgun wood house. We had an outhouse, but then we ended up getting a bathroom. But we had a washing machine with a ringer, but we had to put up all the clothes on the clothesline. And when I was about 12 years old, an angel, this bright light came to me and said that I was going to affect millions of people. Mm -hmm. It did not frighten me. At the time, I sang, and Diana Ross was my shero. Um, and I thought I was going to go on to be a singer. But I kept holding that behind me and understanding. And another thing that I embraced is I believe that everything I go through, I've known this from a young age, was all a part of a master plan. Yes. I always believed that. I never was upset, depressed, whenever I went through something. I always prayed and asked God, because you see, I believe in the omnipotence of God. The sovereignness of God. I mean, I just knew that if God said it to me, it was going to happen. My job was to believe God. The word says that the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered in the Lord. So I felt that my dreams know the way. All I have to do is follow that and always do right by people. Yes. I always believe in doing right by people. And I just really believed that any success that I was going to gain was never for me. I always felt there was a little girl somewhere that was waiting to hear my voice, or a little boy somewhere that could hear my voice of a person that comes out of extreme poverty. And I wasn't wanted as a child. I wasn't. But that empowered me. I'm, I'm an introvert, believe it or not. The people who know me the most know that. I have to perform and do what I have to do in front of others, but in my natural sense of who I am as a human being, I am most comfortable being by myself. Interesting. Very interesting. Your strategic leadership landed you into your ju judicial position. Yes. Right? How did the TV thing happen? Wow. How did the TV thing happen? It was my destiny. Uh, my name comes from, my name is Penny, and my mother named me after a soap opera star from As the World Turns, mm -hmm. Nancy Hughes, had a daughter named Penny Hughes, and on February 23rd, 1961, she lost her baby. So when I say destiny, I think television 
being at the door, I'm named after two college yes, person as I'm looking over it now. I think it was my destiny. My mother died young, a woman who would have been so beautiful, never loved the right men to love her back. And it's a shame because that's how some men are. And it broke her in every sense of the word, and she died young. And the responsibility of my sisters really was on me. People always want to be a success, but you don't know the burden that comes with the success. Because if you are a success and nobody else in your family, they're a success. Even when you give them something, there's resentment that comes as a result of it. Then you carry the guilt of, where are you going to go and you can't bring them? You want to pay for everybody to come. What's the whole point of having things in life if the people you love can't come and enjoy because they can't afford it? I have never been happy being the only one. That's not me. It's not me on a job. I always believe I get something to bring everybody else with me. That's just my, my view. My mother died young. I have younger sisters. I'm sitting there, the judge, thinking I have everything in this world, beautiful home. I don't have debt. I'm very good at finances and money. And so things are going really well for me. And I'm not saying my sisters and my family did not do well, but I just felt an obligation. So I began to pray. And I said, Lord, we've got to figure out how this is going to work. And a mentee of mine by the name of Phaedra Parks. Oh, Phaedra. Yes. Y'all know Phaedra. <laughs> she was from the Atlanta Housewives. Mm -hmm. Was a mentee. She was an attorney at the time. And I make it my one of my uh, life's missions and purpose is to mentor individuals. And she, I mentored her. So she called and said, she was in Los Angeles, and she overheard that they needed someone to be on a show for Dr. Phil. And so I called the Judicial Qualifications Commission to find out, is it okay for me to go? And they said, as long as you're not paid for it, you can do it. So I thought, it'll be fun. And I'm a risk taker. I'm an adventurist. I like taking a chance. And so I went, I thought, well, I had been in California, it'll be fun. I'm going to go, and I was on the Dr. Phil show. And we talked about post-nuptial agreements, I'll never forget, during sweets. Mm -hmm. And when it aired, my life changed. Wow. Hollywood came home. And sweets, for those who don't know, sweets oh. is when everyone <laughs> in the media industry is looking to get the ratings. And they put their top people on, or top shows on, during that time frame, and they're trying to get the attention of everybody. And it was highly rated. Good. Dr. Phil at the time was building his empire mm -hmm. because he was doing a doctor show, which later became The Doctors, and he was looking to do a judge show. I didn't know it at the time when I went on. And then negotiations started about that. As time goes on, my mother passes, and something happened with me. I'm getting ready to go to seminary by then, and I often say I went to the ITC, the Interdenominational Theological Center, in search of God, and I found me mm -hmm. instead. The true nature of who I am, my blackness, because I matriculated through majority white universities, and I really did not know who I, who I am today and all the fullness of me being a black woman, and so the ITC gave me that. And I was in search of God because I just could not understand why after I had finally made it and could finally do for my mother, and I was good to her, why she had to leave. I was at a crossroads in my life. That's why it is really, if you're going to be honest and authentic about this journey, you have to be honest enough to ask God, wait a minute, yeah. right. hold on, right. what, what's going on? And it was hard for me. You could tell it was hard because back in the day when I was on the family court, I used to have this little raspy voice. And that raspy voice came from extreme suppression. Because I came from a background where you didn't question God. You don't question God. God's ways are, you know, you don't question. And I was suppressing a great deal. Just very, very unhappy. I pretended to be happy. Because when your pastor's wife and the first lady and the minister, um, your life is not your own in so many ways. You have to come and you have to be an encourager for other people. But I remember those being very, very dark days for me in search of myself. And uh, the negotiations went back and forth and it didn't work out. So I said, forget it. But then there was a company that offered me to have my show where I could own it. Where you could own it? Yes. They wanted to partner with me. 50-50, and that changed everything. And 
what's amazing about that 50-50 partnership, you saw all of that humanity in her promo. No one else was doing that as a television judge. It was all about slashing you, being aggressive, telling you to get out the courtroom. And to be quite honest, I'm not throwing shade on Judge Matthews or Judy, anybody else, but the game of TV judge shows was about rudeness and sensationalism. And you know that. Yes. You came to the game with a whole different atmosphere. Yeah, let me tell you what happened with that. Because I did come. I wanted to be myself. In fact, I made certain to take off my accent and use my New Orleans accent. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to take it all the way home. Because I wanted to be very clear who I was. Mm -hmm. Because looking at me, there was some ambiguity as to what was my race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be clear that everybody knows they were dealing with a sister. <laughs> from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And one from New Orleans at that. Like 2008 was the time when the bottom fell out. Okay? It was also the time that the Housewives of Atlanta came in. Mm -hmm. And well, your mentee is a part of it. Yes. Paige mm -hmm. was a part of it. Um, it went, I'll, I'll put it to you like this. We've seen some very good shows on television, and they don't make it, if you will. Right. Because people want you to be something else. I wasn't going to be anything. I just didn't. They wanted me to uh, rise up on behavior that I didn't think was befitting of who I am. Right. And so I bought all the rest of my shows and said, wait a minute, my God has something greater for me. But it was very lucrative to the point that I don't have to work anymore. Amen. God blessed me in that way for it. Because I stood on principle, really. Right. And it worked out for you monetarily as well. Yes, and I'm the first judge to have ever been nominated, even Judge Judy wasn't. The first year I came out for an Emmy Award. Wow. So the people liked it, but they thought that when they were looking at the stereotypical, when Housewives came out, it was like the sensation. It still is yeah. in some ways. And people really kind of wanted to see that. So as much as we say now how much we love it, at the time you all wanted all that fighting and cussing and carrying on and weeds throwing. And that was the that. Jerry Springer era <laughs> when you came out. And that was not something I was going to do. Right. Now, I could have continued to pursue it, but there is a funny thing about me and my personality. If it's supposed to be for me, it's not hard. Mm -hmm. So even after I moved to something else and other networks wanted it, I didn't want it anymore. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't want to have to prove myself. I never put myself in situations where I have to prove my worth. Mm -hmm. Never. I will never do that. I'm not in a man in a relationship with a man. If I have to prove to you that I'm worthy of your love, you're not deserving of my love. I never do it, no matter what it looks like. And I'm not afraid to walk away from anything. And I just kept feeling, though, that even if I moved to Fox or went with someone else, because remember now, I'm independent because I owned my own you show. You shopped around. Yes, easily. My agent wanted me to do that. But by then, no, I'm not doing it. People still ask me today. I still get requests. For the last 10 years, every year, people wanted me to do a pilot. Why won't you do it? Because I realized that all money is not good money. Yes. Everything is not about a dollar. I set certain principles based on a little girl watching how my mother and my aunts and everybody else was treated. And I said, I will never, it, it's not healthy for me. It's not good for me as a woman to be in a situation where I have to prove to you that I'm worthy. I don't run behind anybody, and there is nothing, no one or no situation I have to have. And once that's really embedded in who you are, it's easy to walk away from things. Because I'm like you. If we lost everything tomorrow, give me 30 days and I'd have it all back. That's right. I may not have it back the way I had it before, but I'll have it all back. I had somebody ask me on radio about, about a week ago. And they said, well, Rashad, what would you do if CBS fired you? This is a live radio. Mm. And my basic response was, I bet on me. I don't bet on CBS. I bet on me. And I'm okay, and you know this about me, Judge Penny, and you're the same. I'm okay with a platform being taken away from me because I stood up for what was right. Because I was me before the platform. The platform doesn't define me. And if I got it that time, I can get it again. Because I bet on me. Right? 
your leadership as a woman in the marketplace has to be discussed. Because in all of your dealings, even in ministry, you are navigating in a male-dominated marketplace. Give us some of the highlights, some of the gems that you learned as a woman being a top executive and negotiator, successful negotiator in male-dominated marketplaces? That's a very good question and very much needed now because I've been in so many arenas. Uh, the biggest thing, and I love what you said about betting on you, I love that. The actions of anything outside of me don't predicate anything about my destiny. I remember that when we got the news that Pure Howard was not going to run. And everybody was wailing and crying. And they're saying, oh my goodness, what are you going to do? And I said, the prophetic, you know, what he's doing has nothing to do with what I'm going to do. Uh, in ministry, I am authentically myself. I hate women who have a chip on their shoulders and trying to prove something. I am very much a feminine woman, not trying to be, act, look like a man. Yeah. I believe nobody on the planet can do what I do. No one, no one. They can try it, <laughs> they can duplicate it as much as they want. I am me. Yes. And when you feel good about being you, I don't have to prove anything. Remember, I never go in situations where I have to prove it. Right. So let's give you an example. I got it maybe a little easier than other women in ministry because I'm judged. Mm -hmm. So they could always say they were inviting me to the pulpit because judged. I'm judged. Yeah, got the status. I already knew that, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I always did was I always tried to represent women, but I'm never disrespectful to people in their own house. Yes. If somebody comes and invites me to their pulpit, that is not my opportunity to put them down mm -hmm. because they don't believe in women in certain arenas. That's not, that's like going to somebody's house for dinner and insulting them about how they cook. I never did that. And then I never tried to be anybody other than myself when I'm in the boardroom, for example. All of my role models have been, um, not role models, all of my sponsors have been white males. Mm -hmm. All of them. Um, they've seen my career and they've tried to help me. And that's the honest and it's truth. But while I was sitting there, if they cursed, I didn't go into this whole long thing of correcting them. Eventually, the way I carried myself would make them say, oh no, we don't want to do that. Yes. Because I didn't want to be excluded from the room. Because I was, remember now, very strategic. And so there's sometimes you got to do what you have to do to get where you want to be. And so what I would do is, I just wanted to become one of them. So I learned how to play golf. And I did all the things that back in the day, they didn't have any other women there. I was doing that. But I was always conscious that I was there for other people. I was always overprepared. Because I believe that when a person closes their eyes, like if you close your eyes right now, the adjectives that you would list about me would be the same thing as the chief would. Chief Maddox is one of my mentees, and Ty is one of my mentees. Everybody who comes in contact with the Judge Penny Brown Reynolds, would say the same thing about my brain. I'm dependable. I'm always prepared. I'm an intellectual and a scholar. Not because I have to prove that I am, but because I study hard. Right. You don't have to be naturally brilliant. Study hard and prepare yourself for that. I want to be prepared. And do you know I honor all, every place where I am? It could just be the two of us, and it would be the greatest thing that's happening in my life. And I think because I treated everything, I'm a serious person. I don't like foolishness, and I like respect. I demand respect, and if you can't give it to me, you can't occupy my space. Mm. But I say that I need it without having to do a whole lot of drama about it. And I think that's the key. So I think when it's a woman, you know, first of all, we only make 61 cents to every dollar that a white male makes. Um, there are certain stereotypes about us, particularly with what the media does. And I don't have any ill will toward the women who are on the shows that they're on because there should be more opportunities for them. Right. And I think that I don't serve women, particularly black women, well for me to get up and talk about them. Mm -hmm. What I need to do is set a better example. Yeah. Right. 
to show them to try to want to be like me. But I believe they have the right in the marketplace to do just what a brother might do. And then when you know better, you do better because you want to walk in excellence. But I just think that what turns people off is the fact that you should be able to tell me I'm a beautiful woman. And I not get overly sensitive about it. Now, sometimes it may be sexist. I was at a church recently. I preached. Oh, did I preach? Mm -hmm. And I have a man get up and he said, you preach as good as a man. He didn't know any better, Judge. Of course he did. <laughs> he made that in the best way possible. Of course he did. And then he would say, oh, she's just as pretty as she can be after preaching. So there are a couple of things you can do. You can have your face frowned up and you can come and have a chip on your shoulder. Or you can understand that you're a woman of grace and elegance and you show them a more excellent way. So I don't have, I raised boys, I have two grown sons, yeah. and I've been in a house with men, and I'm pretty tough. Right. If my um, sponsors, and when we say sponsors, you know what I mean, you are yeah. one of the sponsors mean. Let's be clear on this, I didn't sleep my way to get anything, mm -hmm. right? That's people who saw something in you. They had a position of power, and they used it to help you if they could. Right. And what I did was I rewarded them by helping other people as well. Mm -hmm. Because it never felt good to me to be the only person. I think it's sinful to do that. Yes. Yes. I don't think God blesses us in order to keep it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think we have an <coughs> obligation, a responsibility before God to help somebody else. Social impact theory. So I'm going to go to my class right now. What are the three dynamics of the social impact theory? <laughs> Say it loud. Empowerment. No, social impact theory. Uh, proximity. 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 Status. Status. That's right. So proximity, status, and group dynamics are part of the social impact theory, and I teach this to uh, some of my classes in reference to how we influence other people. I want you to share how much your status as a judge with that title, with that status uh, accolade, how much did that help you in your negotiations, your conversations, and really penetrating that male-dominated marketplace? Well, first of all, by the time you get, there's so few judges in the country yeah. that are African-American. And, and to be at that young age, uh, in my 30s, uh, being a judge, um, it gave me a great deal of credibility. So I think status may be connected. You know, sometimes we, uh, one of the rabbis said that sometimes we confuse status and notoriety with credibility. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Um, yeah. Rabbi Kushner said that. Mm -hmm. And so I think from a status standpoint, but I never really, uh, kind of looked at, from a, from a leadership standpoint, the dynamics of power, I always walked in authority, which is different. Because power was attached to a title. A position. Mm -hmm. Correct. That position. Long after I've left the bench, I'm able to carry my status, if you will, and the credibility because I use my authority to be effective. That is so rich. That is so rich yes. what she just said. Her leadership, her status is not connected to her position. Wow. It's connected to who she is and how she walks. The essence of me. Right. As a woman, as a leader, as a judge, I took a sworn oath. Um, it's who I am. Right. It's at the core of who I am. That's why I could go on television. I can traverse through various, I can be an entrepreneur and own a makeup company, which I do. I can then be a professor, I can be in the pulpit, because if you are playing to, and everything about your persona, and your brain is attached to the one entity, mm -hmm. then you don't really have authority. The power is attached to mm -hmm. the position. And for me, it was all about authority. And the authority didn't come from me. The authority came from God, who gave it to me, and then I walk in it. And, and, and Dr. Rashad, I love being a woman. There is nothing better on this planet than being a woman. Yes. And I love it. And I walk in and I feel empowered. My whole essence is this. I'm like this all the time. Yeah, I know. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm putting on, this is my no, nature. That, I wake up like this. Every day, 24-7. Yes. 
Triple Seven. Let's talk about your advocacy for young people. Because you are, you always have a word of encouragement. You don't besmirch young people. You don't, I mean, you're not that kind of leader. You don't get on the microphone and start talking down to young folks, even though there's a lot that we could say, right? You're not that kind of leader. Civic engagement is a big part of your advocacy. Jeff, let's play uh, the CW interview when you were talking about young people voting. Let's play some of that. because it was just significant of the fact that we have evolved as a country. <coughs> and welcome back to Speak Up. I'm Leslie Van Arsdale. In today for Natasha Brown, and my guest this morning is the Honorable Penny Brown Reynolds. Of course, you may recognize her from Family Court with Judge Penny. And it's seen right here on the CW Philly weekdays at 11 a.m. Now, beyond being a judge on Family Court, Judge Penny has also had political experience in Georgia, and let's talk for a minute about the importance of younger voters and getting that vote out this election. It's critical. This election is probably one of the most important elections we've ever had for many reasons. I think that I'm so excited that young people have decided to take charge of their future, and there are so many considerations that they have to make, but never before have we seen, and I'm your mother of 28 and 29-year-olds, who have decided to really get involved in terms of volunteering, and it was something that I'd always hoped for, but it's absolutely critical because until we decide as a country to take charge of our own country and get involved in the process instead of complaining, I don't think we'll see any of the changes. So with everything that's going on with the economy, with everything that's going on with crime, uh, Jennifer Hudson's family um, was just murdered horrifically. We see, I saw stuff like this in court all the time. But what was striking to me is seven hours went by before the community even called the police mm -hmm. with gunshots. Well, that's not just a family issue. I, I call it a village issue. It's an issue that affects our entire community that we become so desensitized about all kinds of issues. And so I'm believing that this election will raise our consciousness and levels and we'll begin to have a national discussion about the environment, about energy, about all the issues that really matter to us in America. So I listened to that, and everything you said rings true to that. Mm -hmm. And there's another irony that strikes me personally watching you up there. Um, you were on the CW. The CW was the first network crazy enough to put me on TV. Oh, wow. Okay. And I'm looking at my mentor talking the way she always talks, being an encourager. And you remember at that time, people were really concerned if young folks would actually go out and vote. You were, you believed it. Okay. You said, they're going to do this. And they did. What gave you that insight back then? I'm really connected to a younger generation. Yeah. As old as I am, I feel like I'm 30 years old, 35. Well, I'll go 35. <laughs> um, I, I believe in the power that's within them. Yeah. I have students now, and I tell them there is a genius that's in you, that if you could just tap into it. We think genius in terms of intellectualism instead of the brilliance of imagination. And if you can tap into the imagination of what you think you can be and letting them know they can do that, Young people feel powerless sometimes, but when you give them hope, suddenly they feel the power. And one thing about it, they're not tainted by all of the issues we've dealt with. Yeah. There is something very interesting about them and how we've gone through the civil rights, we know bigotry and racism. Their naivety up until Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. up until Trayvon Martin, they had a naivety about right. it. But after that, with Black Lives Matter and all that's happened with Ferguson and all of the subsequent issues that have just come out to the forefront, it used to be um, covert, now everything is just overt. I still believe in the power of young people wanting something different and wanting something to change. And remember now, Dr. King was young. Right. He died in his 30s. Right. Uh, John Lewis was young when they changed the world. We forget that. And so I just believe in the power of young people uh, and the power of imagination and just believing in something different. 
We're about to go to the Q&A with the audience. Before I get to that, uh, Judge, uh, let me ask you uh, just some simple questions. Okay. All right. Favorite color? Purple. Favorite movie? The color purple. What? <laughs> why, why are you laughing? No, that, that's a really good movie. Why are you laughing? Great. It's a great, because the purple, the purple thing. That's oh, that's what it was. That's all. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, favorite person? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Biggest regret? That I didn't run for public office soon. Well, wait a minute. Wait a I think that was a slip. Yeah, I think so too. She said sooner. Sooner. Oh wait, I didn't mean to say uh, that. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. They'll clean that up and get it for the Um you will be dynamic. And uh, obviously if you run for anything, you have my support, and I'm sure I speak for everyone in this room. Uh, we will support you with vigor. Uh, if you ran bigger. Because not only are you a true one, you have integrity. And you've always had integrity. And we are in a strange political era right now. This is strange, <laughs> to say the least. It's disgraceful. Yeah. It's disgraceful. Mm -hmm. There's no decency anymore. And corruption and bigotry and racism, they spew it out with a badge of honor. And we sit back, cow down, afraid to stand up. Come on. And that's mm -hmm. where uh, I have problems. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, before we go to the Q&A, let me recognize our chief deputy out of DeKalb County, uh, Chief Melvin Maddox, if you stand up. Yeah. The uniform gave you away. <laughs> Always good to see you. Uh, we also have our Chief Magistrate Judge of Fulton County here, Judge Cassandra Kirk. Thank you, Judge Kirk. He's doing an excellent job. Remarkable job. If I say so myself. Remarkable, remarkable woman. Do we have any other elected officials uh, in the room? Okay, let me open it up now to Q&A. We have 30 minutes of Q&A, and we will dismiss, but you definitely have an opportunity to come and have a brief conversation with... Uh, the Honorable Judge Penny Brown Reynolds. So if you have a question, how do we want to do this, Jeff? We got a microphone. So Nicole has a microphone. And you raise your hand, and Miss Nicole will come to you so that we can make sure everybody can hear, even those who are watching us on YouTube, OK? Hello. And social media. All right. Who has a question? Right here. On. Oh, yes. Is it on now? It's going in and out. Go ahead. I'm glad to see you this evening. I'm Rosa. We have met at a few events around town here, and I'm so proud of you. You are a member to me as well. I'm 75 now. <laughs> <laughs> and I have so much respect for our young warrior over there. I listen to it every day. I always promote him, and he's done Thank so you. much for the community and for the world. And my question, what my, my ponders is, is with the, the state of affairs with our country and all that's going on, how should we, people of color, Africans, or whatever, however you dress yourself as, African American, whatever, how should we set our minds and how should we, we get ourselves together? My first one is with God. But in your uh, opinion, how should we? deal with all of this. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I know that Hosea Williams, I don't know if anybody remembers who he is. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. So, said you can't help anybody until you help yourself. Right. So I know that we have to spend time getting together with our families, being fathers in our homes and mothers in our homes. And if there are no fathers in our homes and women being, you know, we know over 70% of women raise our children. And so being good stewards of that, and then because we are a tribal people anyway, that we came from Africa being tribal, we are in the times now where we're going to have to put some of that aside. We've got to come together. There is a resistance that we have to create against jealousy and envy because a lot of that kind of 
derails what we'll do for other people because we bought into the oppressor's view of what is out here. And I'll give you an example. They will have us to believe that there are limited resources when we know that all things come from God and there's an abundance of everything. So if I use my connections to get Dr. Rashad on MSNBC, what is that going to do to hurt me? Mm. If, Doc, if Judge Kirk is on the bench, what does it do to hurt me to help her? But we have to be in touch with self in order to be able to help other people because then we're not intimidated by other people. But it's time now for us to come together as a people and understand we have to know who we are and we don't know who we are. We think we're some distant place from Africa. And we are Africa. We built this country. We have to stop saying we're slaves. We are not slaves. We were enslaved. We have to begin to say the truth, because I think the truth will be the thing that will bring us together. After we have gotten ourselves together, personally, after we've gotten our families together, then we build our communities together by supporting one another. Then we must move to other races and connecting with other races. Because that vicious, evil situation, corruptible spirit that is in the land now, they fuel from us being separated. And that's what they would like to do. And so that's my view of how we can kind of, I'm not saying it's an easy solve, but I just believe that if we use those steps, we can then take all of us further than we could ever have imagined. We're Question. stronger together than we'll ever be separate. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Who else we got? Any other questions for Judge Penny? Hello, my name is Opta Song, and I'm studying here for the, uh, the business administration. And I'm the nurse uh, working at the Emory Hospital. And also, I'm going to the school for the uh, Oriental Medicine School. But I like this opportunity, and uh, I respect Dr. Ritchie very much. And uh, giving us uh, this opportunity, I thank you very much. You. And um, as a you know, minority, I'm the first immigrant, mm -hmm. but I still have a dream. And it's not uh, about the, you know, making money or political or anything like that. But I do have a dream to serve the people and educate the people how to be themselves. And that's what, you know, you gave me a lot of inspiration about the, uh, you know, how we live our lives, right? Being yourself, authentically, that is the matter. That is the real good thing about, you know, being yourself and the self-confidence and don't feel an impurity. Yes. And a lot of people feel that way because I'm not better than anybody else, but we actually are. We all are, you know, personal you know, identity, and they are, you know, such a valuable person in many ways. But I wish that, you know, everybody feels that way. And my question is, what is your ultimate goal? To become, ultimate goal, to become. Why did you ask that? <laughs> I always play all of that stuff real close. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow, it's so many. Okay. Okay. Good question. Good question. Good question. Good question. Thank you. I love that, and I love how you expressed yourself. And I really think true leaders, because this is leadership talk, are people who really are doing what they're doing in order to be an inspiration to other people. Mm -hmm. I just really believe that God is pleased with that. What I do, and I've done it all along, is I'm, I prepare myself. So I'm getting a PhD. And so what would a PhD be used for? Higher education? Uh, we've been constructing our education or higher education the way we did in the 18th century. And we need to do it in a different way now. We need to inspire. A lot, you know, I, I teach. And so I have a class before my class, which is 7 o'clock in the morning, where my students come on their own mm -hmm. uh, to have a life class mm -hmm. before we get into the law part. And so maybe in higher education, maybe in diplomacy, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I'm an arbitrator and a mediator, and I believe that would be an opportunity for that. And then elected office. 
in some way. Um, I made a lot of mistakes. You don't get up and talk about mistakes. Uh, we are not, we're the total sum of everything we've been through. I've loved the wrong people and done things that, well, I've never done really bad things. I've never had drugs or done any of that kind of stuff. So when I say bad things, my husband says, you're paying me two shoes, so your bad things <laughs> are not a whole lot of bad things. But what I think, more than anything, I've suffered. And I think that there is an honor that came from suffering. But it is true. It is true. You know, life is never fulfilled without the agony. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, we all go, you know. Yeah. But it's power. Hardships. It's power in that. Because what stifles people yeah. is when they get trapped mm -hmm. by the agony. They get angry with God. They get angry with themselves. And they don't realize that that's not a permanent status. That that's something that builds you up and take the things that's been the worst things in your life and use that to try to propel your life to where you want to be. That was a good question because nobody question. asked me. It's almost like asking a child, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> Especially when you've been everything already. Right. I believe the sky is the limit. I will work until I close my eyes and I make it to heaven. I know that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to dream. I have an imagination that's going to take me all the way to heaven. Because when God says, that good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a few things. Yes. Now come on in, my darling, and be ruled over many. It will be because I will go out of this world knowing that I have done everything in the liberation of not only my people and women, but all people. So you'll see, I think the best is yet to come. I yeah. think so too. <laughs> Great question. I got I to gotta bring up your uh, husband, um, Pastor Reynolds. The first time I met him, met him, was preaching at the church. Mm -hmm. And he did an excellent job, yes. by the way. Thankful to God. Thankful for the invite. And I spoke to him on the phone one time, and he's like you, courteous, encouraging, nice. And when I was in this brother's presence, this is no lie, I looked at this brother and the way he spoke with his ministerial leaders, the way he spoke to the congregation, the way he treated me, the hospitality, uh, the encouragement, the respect, I said, I clearly see why Judge Penny fell in love with this brother. And it's okay to say that as a man. As a man, it's good for me, it's good for you, I'm talking to all my brothers in here, to see that kind of example in another man. And how, I want to know how has his presence in your life helped shape you and what you do every day? He's made all the difference in my life. My husband is my hero. Mm. Oh, yeah. He is my hero. Assignment with you, 
is I'm not just a mentor, I am a mother figure. I take that responsibility very seriously. I say just what I have to say. He and I are very candid with one another. But I think that he deserves for me to see him in a way. I don't do the king, queen thing as much, but he is really my hero. Because he walks, he walks. My husband only ever wanted to be a pastor. He is a, he was a higher education um, administrator. But his essence of who he is, and where we have a small congregation of maybe three, four hundred people, he never wanted to make a church. He wanted what he has. He's honored to pastor the people that he has. He, when you say let me, it's not that kind of way. He's not threatened by my persona. Right. You know, I went off to California to do my show. That's nothing for him. That takes a man. Yeah. Some of my best friends, most of my friends are male. He never thinks that way because we have integrity with one another and we have respect because words matter. There's some things you can't take back. Yeah. And in a marriage, I don't emasculate my husband mm -hmm. because he will never call me out my name. Mm -hmm. And so, and I never compromise and he never does. And he has swag, he dresses just like you do. And, <laughs> you know, you're a younger version of him. I think you might be a little bad boy than my husband. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Sister Tyson, who said she would never play a role that degrades the mm -hmm. black woman. Yeah, she did. I haven't heard that in over. But I, I, I've watched you over the years, of, but I never really knew you. I never really uh, grasped you until this past Saturday over at New Piney Grove, uh, dealing with the gun violence. Yes, but I heard something in you that I couldn't stop thinking about you all over the weekend. In your message, it really struck to my core because it revolves around just the truth that you spoke, you know, which we need more than anything. And uh, you kind of reminded me, because you had a critique of the church, but mainly you reminded me of, because oftentimes people mention Dr. King a lot, but we forget about, we think about that 1963 Dr. King. <laughs> but the Dr. King after 1966, we run from that Dr. King, because he used his prophetic voice. He used the scriptures to critique America, and we're afraid to do that. But when I heard you, I left from there thinking about the Reverend Jeremiah Wright, mm -hmm. who is this dispensation time is the only one that I know on that level who, who speaks, who, who lives up to the prophetic role that we must play as watchmen over the wall. So my question to you is that when President Obama was first elected, uh, President Jimmy Carter said white people, are when all the racism came out, he said white people are tired of pretending. We've gone through a, almost a 50-year period of, of master deceit. And like we said, this whole generation don't, don't know white people. We were very young. We were part of what they call that middle generation. Those that were born between 1950 and 1960, 1955 and 1960, we have a very special role. And I hear you living up to that role we were born to do. But it's just dealing with, my question revolves around prophecies dealing with the times. And that's what scares me more than anything, that we preach a good message, but if, but we, if we skip over prophecies dealing with the times that we're living in, we're not going to understand, not really be able to navigate to get through. So how, because of what I heard in you this past weekend, that your critique, because the church and the truth is all we have, but if we really don't start dealing with, helping us understand prophecies dealing with these times, I think we're going to be losers as a people. So if you can, uh, if you just get something, how do you, well, you can just comment on something that I said. Because then last week when I left there, <coughs> you remind I went to Isaiah 20, I mean 61. And I, I heard something in you, because I was like, because what I heard out of you, I was just, just overwhelmed, you know, just the spirit and the, and the strength to help us to really understand the time and what we must do if we're going to survive and thrive in a time like this. Thank you so much, my brother, and I do remember you being there. When I said that one of my regrets is that I did not run for public office, 
is because every prophet that has spoken truth has been murdered. And although I don't walk in fear, I know the awesome responsibility that comes with it. But it is true that truth that will bring people together. Because my message, believe it or not, as much as it resonated with you, the whites that were there were the ones that waited for me as well to let me know that I gave them something to think about. But what they admired is the truth. Because the truth is what makes us free. It can't set us free because we have to walk in our freedom. And it takes that kind of power. But when you look even through the, the sacred scriptures and you look at the prophets who during the times, whether it's Amos or Jeremiah or Isaiah, it takes great courage. The people, it's a very lonely place. I know my assignment. I'm running from my assignment. And I can be very transparent with you because you're one of the rare people that really can see through this and saying what I want to do. I know you know it as well. It is a heavy burden to carry what I carry because there are things that I have had to walk away from because I carry that truth in me. But now carrying the truth is not enough. I have to not only speak the truth, the PhD is helping me to understand the truth. And then the next thing is I must promulgate the truth. So after that PhD, the next phase is, I've got to take action. Yeah. But when Dr. King took action, what happened? Exactly. He wasn't killed because he was the peacemaker. Right. Right. He was the one who spoke up against Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He was there that night against the Poor People's Campaign. Right. And what am I writing my PhD studies are in? The decriminalization of poverty, because I came out of poverty. I don't hear anybody running for president today talking about keeping people out of poverty. America has been a lot of things, but America has been a place of imagination that allowed us to get where we want. But America has some issues that we have to deal with. And we keep putting people in office who say just enough to get us to buy into it, and they breach their contract toward us by not doing what they've been called to do. And many times they do it because they're trying to make it. They're trying to get along. But the burden of being a prophet for the current times is one that I carry. I mean, it's heavy to carry. Yes. And I think about Joseph. Yes. Joseph had the dream because I'm a dreamer. Everybody knows the story of Joseph. Joseph's coat, if you will, if I can use it metaphorically, that beautiful coat that he was given. In the day, it wasn't called a coat. It was called a mantle. And we know when we have a mantle, it's something that you carry. And so because of that, he was thrown in a kit. Because of that, he was thrown in a dungeon. Yes, he ended up coming out. The palace wasn't anything to him. He was a spokesman for the nation. And he reached back to his people and forgave them and brought them in. But that was a heavy burden. And to any way I have any cowardness in me, it is the fact that I have to brace myself for being that person who can speak truth. Because I do have the ability. You can't move a nation with just your people. And so when other races will connect with me through the power of truth, I know what my assignment is. But I have run from it, just like all the prophets have. But I thank you for recognizing it and for even allowing me to unleash the imagination that maybe it won't be as hard. Maybe I can somehow escape what Dr. King escaped. But I don't know. You know, I'm just hoping because people are with you till they're not with you anymore. Everybody tries to push you up. Times get hard. You look around. You can't find anybody. But if my people who are called by my name, if we all could understand who has called us. And I do believe in the universality of humanity. I just don't believe that what I have been called to do I know that I will liberate my people because I'm a liberated theologian. I come out of liberation theology. Absolutely. Right? I believe that. I see everything as religion either oppressing you or liberating you. Absolutely. And I never put myself in situations where I'm oppressed. I just don't. I like to just, I'll be by myself first. But it carries such a big responsibility because you can't get to me anymore with money. You can't get to me anymore with love. My husband is solid. He's there. Can't take him from me. My family, I've got that. I've got
got the love, admiration comes and goes. You know, I never hold on to too much of that because people are fickle. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of gotten to the point now where I've got, I'm getting the understanding and the reflection, and so now I'll be called to action. And so therefore, when the young lady asks me what's next, mm -hmm. sometimes I go to sleep at night and I say, Lord, I know what's next, but I don't want to mm -hmm. say what's next. Mm -hmm. And so I'm actually running from it. And thank you for allowing me to unburden myself by even saying it. And I haven't even said what it is. I'll leave it up to everybody's imagination. <laughs> wow. Wow. We have time for one, maybe two more questions. Before I get to the questions, uh, let me do this because Buell High University is, is unique in higher education because it allows for opportunities like this on a regular basis and so much more goes down on this campus. We have what's called practitioner scholars at Buell High University where our professors are also experts in their field in the real world. Mm. They're scholars and they are practitioners. Um, I want to recognize Dr. Wilson. Dr. Wilson, thank you for coming up with this. Have a good evening. Trish, thank you, sister, for all you do. Um, to my big homie Jeff, who's behind that glass. Yeah. He's our IT guy, sound guy, <laughs> all of that. Uh, to the entire staff, and uh, especially to our president, who's not here. He's, he's far, far away doing a whole lot of good work. Uh, Dr. Karanja, uh, who personally recruited me to work as a professor at the university. I just want to give this whole college a round of applause. Yeah. All right, we got time for one or two more. How are you, sis? I'm wonderful, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to just be in your presence. I'm Dr. MJ. I help you live the healthy way every day at any age. And like you, I have one of those burdens because I'm a naturopath and people, uh, the power to be, are real excited about people like me. However, there's one issue that I wanted to get your opinion on, and it may be, I'm understanding and hearing something about the, the communication issues that are going on. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not even quite sure how to say it, but I'm, I'm understanding there's some issues that our rights to communicate are going to be taken away, and something dealing with Byron Lewis and, and um, the one who bought the Weather Channel, something dealing with media, and, um, and there's going to be uh, something going on November 13th, some type of hearing or something like that, and I just wondered if you knew anything about that or could address that in any way, because I was listening to Dr. Slaughter talk about it a little right. bit this morning. So, so obviously there are threats. And uh, even the current administration has talked about uh, basically eliminating content that may be adversarial to what they will call as truth. I think that's a lot of hyperbole, but you never know. Uh, but I'll say this. I don't care if a media outlet is regulated by the government and says, you can't say this or can't say that. Um, I go ahead and get a live streaming on my phone <laughs> and post it on my social media. If social media gets shut down, I go ahead and go outside and shout it in the middle of the street. So they can't silence your voice. See, all of these operations, media, social media, that's just a method of distribution, people. That's all it is. It's just a method of distribution. They can't actually silence your voice. Now, they may be able to take away a few of your platforms, they may be able to stop the echo chamber of what you're saying, but that means you just got to say it loud. That's all. All right, so don't get so bent out of shape about one platform or another. Uh, be you, be authentic to you, and say exactly what you know God has put inside of you to say, and everything else will work out. That's just my opinion. I agree. I hadn't heard about it, but uh, this fear-mongering is laughable to me. At some point, we've got to find courage somewhere. Come on. Amen. Have you been through something Come enough? On that gives you the courage to know that if you made it through that, yes. surely you can make it through anything? Yes. That's right. Are you in such bondage that if they let you go from your job through disrespect or fear, you can't get another one? On you can't buy another car or get another house? Mm -hmm. And so the strength that you're speaking of is the fact that no matter what happens, I will always have a place on this earth for me. That's right. And There's I made no walk in fear. I made it through Glenwood. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, man? I made it through Glenwood, and I'm thankful to God for 
all of the platforms. But the one that I had to conquer first was the hood, right? And once you can overcome that, there's a significant authenticity about overcoming the circumstances that you had nothing to do with. And everything is not going to work out the way you want it to work out. You, you take what appears to be defeat as truly a permanent place. If it does not work out for me, I don't, okay, I move on to the next thing. Because that thing outside of me will not define me. I am just that militant about failure. You just, it's not going to define me. You don't get that kind of power over me. Amen. And so if something doesn't work out, it just doesn't work out. There's something much better for us. But boy, we miss out on so much because we stay stuck in needing the approval of even that thing that we have. Do you know how much we identify with what we gather, those things that we gather around us? And what really, I'll I, I leave you with this. What does freedom look like to you? Mm. If you say you're free, but what does that really look like? What has you in bondage right now? What are you in bondage to? Mm -hmm. Anything that you fear? What do you fear? What's holding you back from going after that which you know belongs to you? Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Penny Brown. Yeah. Discussion and you're free to come up and holler at the system. Thank you, Thank you all. You